everybody and uh, a very warm welcome to this IPPR event to launch the Commission on Health and Prosperity. I'm Karis Roberts and I'm Executive Director here at IPPR. Um, I'm going to talk you through a little bit of the housekeeping and introduce the Commission and then we're going to hear from some brilliant panellists today. So just in terms of housekeeping, this launch is going to be recorded and it will be made available on our website, so just be aware of that. Um, and we will have a Q&A session. So if you have any general contributions, you can put that in the chat box, but please put any specific questions into the Q&A box so that I can then direct those to our panellists. Um, so why are we here today? Well, we're here to introduce uh, the Commission on Health and Prosperity. And before we do so, I just wanted to reflect on the current moment and the reason that we're launching this commission now. Of course, that does mean reflecting on the pandemic. The devastation has been severe. In terms of a human cost, 180,000 people have died. Latest data shows an estimated 1.7 million living with long COVID. And our NHS has been pushed beyond breaking point. The pandemic also created huge economic challenges, of course. You would need to look back more than 300 years to Europe's great frost to find a bigger one-year fall in UK GDP as seen in 2020. And what this has made so incredibly clear is the fundamental link between good health, a prosperous country, and our collective security. Or as the Commission contends, that a fairer country is a healthier one, and a healthier one is a more prosperous one. There are opportunities right now to embed this reality in better, fairer policy, both locally and nationally. The government's inclusion of a health mission in the levelling up white paper, the health and care secretary's focus on disparities, the Labour Party's exploration of national ambitions like health that can supplement GDP, all make this a defining moment for the future of our health and why we've chosen this moment to launch a commission. But for that moment to translate into real change, we now need to recalibrate how health is seen by politicians and policymakers. In our view, we can't continue to see illness as a cost to be contained. Instead, we need to see health far more as a keystone of prosperity and have understand to exist far beyond the health sector. That requires big thinking from a broad coalition, and that's what this commission will deliver. Over the next two years, it's going to deliver a blueprint to improve health and build prosperity. And it will bring together a hugely exciting and diverse group of commissioners, uh, some of whom I'm delighted are joining us today, um, and that I'm also honoured to be able to join as a commissioner myself. Um, in a moment, we'll hear from Chris Thomas, head of the Commission on Health and Prosperity and Principal Research Fellow, to discuss the analysis that we released yesterday, introducing the commission. Um, but first, I just wanted to say a few thank yous and then to introduce our other speakers. Uh, so we'd like to thank the NHS Confederation, Lane Clark and Peacock, um, and Carnal Farah for partnering on the Commission. We'd also like to acknowledge the financial support uh, for the Commission on Health and Prosperity by our sponsors. So that is ABVI, the Alzheimer's Society, AstraZeneca, Bristol Myers Squibb, British Heart Foundation, Gilead, GSK, Impact on Urban Health, Janssen and Siemens Health and Ears. So there's a huge number of people uh, contributing and making this commission possible who we'd like to thank. Uh, so after Chris has introduced uh, some of our core hypotheses, we'll hear from Professor Dame Sally Davis, uh, who is one of the chairs of the commission. She is Master of Trinity College, Cambridge, and former Chief Medical Officer. We'll hear from uh, her co-chair, Professor Lord Aridazi, co-director of the Institute for Global Health Innovation, Imperial College London, and former Health Minister. We'll hear from Sophie Howe, Future Generations Commissioner for Wales. And I will say now that uh, Sophie will need to leave us at approximately two o'clock, so she's not just disappearing if, if you no longer see her face. And then finally, we'll hear from Marie Gabriel, who is Chair of the NHS Race and Health Observatory. I am also going to warn you that Marie has uh, undergone some dental work, and so she's not going to make the opening remarks, but she will join in for the full, full discussion. Um, so that is enough introduction from me. Initially, I'm going to hand over to Chris to talk us through some of the uh, findings that we published yesterday. Thanks, Karis. Hi, everyone. It's, it's brilliant to see so many of you. Um, I'm just going to talk us through a few things that, that we put out in the way of new analysis that substantiate some of what Karis has talked through in terms of the, the kind of contentions and hypotheses of the Commission. Um, hopefully that will help us kind of form the conversation and also uh, think through some kind of questions for, for later in the webinar. So I'll just put a couple of uh, things on screen. Um, 
Great. So hopefully that's now showing up. So I just wanted to talk through uh, four or five charts that that, that we released uh, yesterday in, in line with the launch of the commission. Um, the first thing that I wanted to flag is I think it's a nice introduction to the kind of why and also a substantive point in its own right is that good health is one of the people's clearest priorities. So our analysis of Ipsos Mori polling from the last 40 years suggests that health is one of the most frequent, if not the most frequent topic that people mention when they say what matters to them and what matters to the future of the country. So that's kind of an introduction to why this matters and why better policy you know, has a mandate to, uh, to, to be thought, thought through. And it also means that if we're going to deliver on a people's priority, if we're going to say that seriously, that there's a case to think very carefully about how good health is seen and particularly how that's seen in politics and by policymakers. So that's where the transition that Karis has already talked about comes in. So from illness as a cost to be contained, um, so an inconvenient budget line, something that needs to be brought down, limited at all costs, to good health as a keystone in building a fair, secure and prosperous country. Now, I've highlighted prosperous on purpose because I think it's something that's particularly important, that link between health and prosperity is something that we're not always very good at recognising and building into policy. Um, but it's also something that we need to make sure that we're defining as broadly as possible. So in thinking of that breadth of definition, I wanted to point to three charts from yesterday's uh, launch report. So first is the kind of innate value of health. And I think it's always important to start by thinking about health as an enabler of the kind of lives that we want people in this country to be able to live. So this is just one indicative example, but the correlation here amongst uh, advanced economies uh, between healthy life expectancy at birth and uh, the number of friends and relatives people have that they can count on. Probably a two-way relationship. Uh, if we have good health, then we can have thriving relationships. If we have thriving relationships, then we're more likely to have good health. Um, but indicative, I think, of the, the relationship between health and the good life, of course, part of that prosperity definition. Health is also vital for fairness and justice. And I think it would be hard to see prosperity without those foundations of fairness and justice. Working with Lane Clark Peacock, we looked at how average income and healthy life expectancy relate across local authorities in the UK. And what we see is that in some parts of the country, healthy life expectancy is low. In the case of Blackpool, you'll see it's over a decade before the state retirement age but that health inequality and economic inequality tend to be two sides of the same coin. So um, again, something that will exist probably in a mutually enforcing um, circle. Those, uh, if you have lower income, it's harder to find work, uh, harder to find good work, then health might be lower. If you're unhealthy, then that might have knock-on consequences in terms of uh, your livelihood or your prosperity. But also it matters health in terms of the kind of things that define the economy. So the big economic challenges that we face are analysis indicates that health can be part of the solution, uh, a big part of that solution. So in the case of the labor market, um, we uh, find that the just the, the uptick in long-term illness since the start of the pandemic has forced a huge number of people out of the UK labor market at a cost of eight billion pounds uh, in 2022. Um, the challenge here is at a time that the UK uh, is predicted by the IMF by next year to be uh, the G7 nation with the lowest growth in GDP, is can we really afford to not take health seriously as a determinant of things like the labor market, really important parts of the UK economy. I'm gonna pause there, I, I think that gives us uh, and if I stop sharing my screen, um, hopefully a kind of sense of some of the initial evidence that, that we've put together in launching this commission and helps us uh, inform a really good conversation going on. Um, but I'll hand back, I think, to you, Karis, and looking forward to that. Fantastic. Thanks very much, Chris. Uh, so we'll now hear some opening remarks um, from our panellists who will speak for about five minutes each. If I could just invite the uh, panellists to, to turn their cameras on so that we can all see you. Um, and I'm going to hand over to Sally first. Thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction and Chris to you too for starting us off. 
Um, as we were beginning to discuss this commission, I had just published with a colleague, Jonathan Pearson Stuttart, a book called Whose Health Is It Anyway? And we were addressing some of these issues. We argue in that book that we must reposition health as our country's most untapped opportunity for prosperity and happiness. We emphasized how health is not just physical, but it's mental and social. And actually you could include um, embracing spiritual in that social. So these are issues that we believe need exploring. And I'm delighted Johnny is one of the commissioners too. And this commission therefore offers this fantastic opportunity to explore the ideas and put some of them into practice. And so that explains why I'm rather excited about the whole commission. We know for our society and economy, we all need a stronger foundation of better health to flourish. We uh, can look at how those inequalities played out in COVID. And we should always, I believe, start by recognizing the innate value, as Chris said, of good health. It's important to a good life and our participation in the community, in flourishing relationships and actually getting work in one of my chief medical officer reports. We had a wonderful chapter. Well, it isn't wonderful, it's sad, from the um, uh, director of the um, uh, IPR, no, FR, anyway, an economist. And what he showed very clearly was how important health was to being in work and therefore prosperity. And, you know, we can enable health. We can enable it by preventing illness. But to do that, as a society, we've got to care because we've got to design our economy, our public services, and the NHS to prevent ill health. And our private sector play a big role here. And importantly, of course, and it shouldn't need saying, but I want to say it, we want to support people living with long-term conditions. We want everyone to have the best health they can. Good health cannot only be the reserve of those without health conditions. In solving our poor health, it's also important to recognize the centrality of good health to fairness. This has already been mentioned, but in the UK, health inequality and economic inequality are two sides of the same coin. In fact, they're a vicious cycle, Fewer economic opportunities lead to bad health, bad health limits opportunities and um, employment, as I've mentioned. And so we've got to be determined to break this cycle. But as we've also highlighted, health is that keystone to a flourishing economy as well. And I think that statistics from yesterday's IPPR report, report that was released yesterday, Making a tangible link between good health and work is very important. As mentioned already, over the last two years, the pandemic and the rise in long-term illness has forced some 400,000 out of the workplace at a cost of eight billion pounds. Individuals can't afford this. As a society, we can't. And that's a clear example of why health is so important. Health matters to everyone. We're not the first to know this and recognize it. Health was a national mission for the Victorians. Their leaps forward, for example, on housing and sanitation were not only justified in their value to human health, but also for their value to the economy. By contrast, in today's world, we've been rather good at defining the problem. We talk about the social determinants of health that account for the majority of inequality but we've been very much less good at talking about meaningful action. And actually I want to call time on talking about determinants of health. It's time to start thinking proactively and talking about drivers of ill health because they should be changed and they can be changed as long as we collectively decide we're going to do so and choose and go forwards to get there. We're going to have to build the case for the broad value of health. And that's how we can reinvigorate political commitment to improving health and closing health inequalities. Very important. 
And after all, this is leveling up. So in summary, let me say that having experienced COVID-19, I think we've got an opportunity to grasp to make health our national mission. And this commission is going to define what that means. This is rather exciting. And our uniting vision, as you heard from Chris, is that a fairer country is a healthier country. A healthier country is more prosperous. And we are at the start of the process. I can't be more excited um, than about developing a new blueprint with better lives and livelihoods at the cure over the next 18 months. I can think of no better, fairer and cost effective way to radically improve the health and wealth of our great nation. So I hope you'll all come on this journey with us. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sally, for those opening remarks. Um, I'm going to come now to Arif. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Klaus. Thank you very much for, firstly, to be part of this uh, wonderful initiative. And, uh, and I think Sally touched on some of the critical and most important points is why we're examining this relationship between health and wealth uh, post COVID-19. I think the pandemic proved that something needs to change in this country's approach to health and its economy too. So I'm very pleased to be part of this broad coalition of commissioners. And I think we're all united in what this look, will look like in practice. The pandemic was a big shock, big shock, probably one of the biggest shock in this generation and certainly in modern history and provided us with some very, very clear lessons about the future of what this country could look like if we take a set of actions. I think it's proved that we need to put health at the heart of our strategy for a stronger economy and certainly a greater security, both a physical and a health security. And I will come back to that point. I think the link between health and wealth can sometimes seem very abstract. However, we've now have had an incredible tangible example, the creation of the COVID-19 vaccines probably at a speed never seen in the history of mankind. And that speed was critical for the economic recovery, which was based on the health recovery, or at least neutralizing the health threat uh, towards the end of the pandemic. And I think we're gonna see more and more studies in the future looking at the economic impact of the, the, or at least the value of the vaccine. And I think one recent study looked at this and measured at least the impact of the vaccine in the US alone was around $5 trillion. That's a huge, huge return of investment. I'll probably describe it as the best buy you can have in any form of health intervention. And it's also a testament of a true collaboration between government, business, civil society, and let's not forget universities, the science, the science underpinned all our policy thinking over the last two or two and a half years. The question is, how do we spread the success more widely in the future? Sally has already outlined the huge value of better population health. Uh, so I'm gonna focus mostly on the prosperity potential of the wider health sector. The major opportunities is to capitalize on the spirit of the vaccine. I think for the first time, we feel secure and confident enough that science could address the challenges or the threats to our health, which in turn does return, at least salvages the economic threats as a result of the health insecurity and our own security as a whole. I think if you look at historically, certainly in the UK, uh, science and more of the science that we've had in the last two and a half years can itself boost the UK economy. Uh, I declare I'm the chair of the Accelerated Access Collaborative and I sit on the Life Sciences Council and constantly we're pushing our political leaders to have a greater investment in R&D, uh, boosting the public investment, supporting our medical research charities who've actually got a big, big hit uh, over the last two years during COVID. Some of the major charities like Cancer Research UK essentially halved their income, uh, which was based on the very generous contribution of 
British uh, subjects across the country. We need to build a capacity in private sector investments, venture funds coming in into our shores and investing in our science. Life sciences is hugely productive. They can bring jobs to places that needs them most, uh, help us level up across the country. And they could also support a greater growth at a time where organizations like the International Monetary Fund predicts that the UK's GDP will be one of the slowest growing uh, in the G7 by 2023. So we need to do the science, but that's not enough. We should also hunt for other opportunities to address some of the future threats. And if I could just describe to you, you know, we take physical security for granted. You know, we've left home today. We know there is a local community police that is protecting our home and our family in our homes. We have defense system protecting us from external threats, as we sadly see what's happening in Europe at the moment. But health security is no different. You know, the invisible threat of COVID, and there are many invisible threats ahead of us. And that's why we need to invest, not just in infectious disease, but in antimicrobial resistance, which I know Sally has championed globally. Mental health, the burden of mental health post pandemic is huge. I feel it in my own organization where I work. Uh, you know, heart disease, dementia, all of these need urgent set of actions. It needs a collaborative mission that harness the spirit of the vaccine creation. The science is there. We just need to invest in that to protect our health. If we protect our health, we're going to protect and grow our economy. Our, our commission, which I'm very proud to be part of, will put forward answers to how we achieve this in practice. Obviously, the other big player here is the National Health Service, which has been the powerhouse in the UK's economy. It can do this by modernizing its services, and we have to think about this in a very careful way. We've learned a lot of lessons during COVID. We've seen some of the deficiencies of the National Health Service, and we see some unbelievable examples how superior our National Health Service is in contrast to other health system, especially the one across the pond. And we need to move the whole system from the sick care into what I would describe as a preemptive and a health security mindset. Because if you do have a preemptive mindset, when you look at your economy, you need to look at a preemptive mindset to your health to protect your economy. But it's also one of the biggest employers in the world, as we know, uh, and, and you know, even bigger, some of the big private companies that we do our shoppings with on a weekly basis, Amazon and, and others. And I think NHS can play the role of this anchor, bringing these institutions together. But also, the NHS has a huge role in revitalizing our high streets, build uh, our, our communities, creating new markets. Uh, you know, the NHS is one of the biggest markets for the life sciences industry in Europe and supported supply chain. So that's another indirect contribution towards the economy. So the important thing in many ways is how do we, uh, how, how do we build this? How do we build this alliance? And how do we continue this mantra of the association between health and our economic growth for the future? And I think it's important to always remember there would be no greater insult to those who've lost their lives and livelihoods over the last two years is to allow this country and the people to be remain exposed to future crises. And these future crises will happen. And I think their frequency will be even greater than it was in the last century. So we must all act now and we must all act together. And I'm very grateful for this commission, which is very timely in its sets of recommendations. Thank you very much, Ara. Uh, Sophie, I'll turn to you next. Thank you. It's my um, it's my pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Um, I think that um, the interesting thing that I've um, drawn from the conversations and the uh, contributions that have uh, happened so far is the word connections. 
Um, Chris talked about the connection between what people actually want in terms of good health and what they're, uh, what they're actually getting, and perhaps there's a bit of a, a disconnect um, there. Sally talked about the connections between health and all other policy areas. And if we look um, to the work done by the World Health Organization, looking at the uh, reasons for the life expectancy gap and where I'm sitting um, in the north of Cardiff, today. Um, I've got every chance of living between 10 and 15 years longer um, than people who live just three or four miles down the road from me in the south of Cardiff. And the reasons for that difference in life expectancy, actually only 10% of that um, difference is about what happens in the healthcare system itself. 35% is about our income you know, are we living in poverty? Can we put food um, on the on the table? So the quality of our homes. Are we living in areas of high air pollution? Do we have access um, to nature and public open space? And so on. Nineteen percent um, is about relationships and social capital. And when um, we often talk about this sort of shift to a well-being economy and well-being in all policies, it can sometimes seem to be this soft and fluffy stuff um, that no one can quite pin down relationships and social and human capital difference in life expectancy. It's far from fluffy. It's actually a really hard metrics and a really hard area that we should be focusing on. And so those connections between different policy areas are absolutely crucial, making sure that health is seen as everyone's business and also that the way in which the healthcare system itself operates sees these wider issues of well-being as being part of their own delivery of uh, population health. So, for example, if the healthcare system across the world um, was the country, it would be the fifth biggest emitter of carbon um, in the world. And we know all of the problems that are caused by um, air pollution, by carbon dioxide, the longer term problems that are coming our way in terms of the impacts of climate change. We also know that it's the people who are most likely to be on the um, you know, main users of services in our healthcare system who are most likely to be the most vulnerable to the effects of climate change. And yet, on the one hand, the healthcare system will be picking up these people, on the other hand, and they are part of the very problem that are creating it. So those connections between all of those wider policy areas and what our healthcare system itself does is absolutely crucial. The other connections for me, um, and Ara talked about this, the connections in terms of the opportunities around collaboration. So to solve some of the big challenges that we face as a society, whether that's about population health, whether that's about addressing the climate and nature emergency, or whatever, none of us, no one organisation or sector can deal with those challenges alone. So collaboration, moving beyond our boundaries, talking to and engaging with unusual suspects will be absolutely critical to meeting some of those challenges. And then I think the other um, element is around the long term. What we do today will, of course, affect the lives that future generations lead. And um, the healthcare system and the uh, whether that's, you know, whether my young daughter who is eight um, is um, able to use a healthcare system in the same way as I might be able to use it now, whether she needs to use a healthcare system in the same way that we might need to use it now depends very much on the decisions that we today take, whether we invest in the long term or whether we continue with a model where certainly in Wales, an increasing proportion of the entire Welsh government budget is spent on dealing on, on, on the NHS and primarily dealing with the acute end of health rather than in, in investing in those wider determinants. So it's absolutely crucial, I think, that we have um, holistic long-term preventative framework for shifting from where we are at the moment um, managing, perhaps we should call it a national illness service, to actually um, adopting and adapting to a national um, well-being or wellness system. And in Wales, um, we're certainly not perfect and we have some huge challenges on health, high levels of poverty um, and deprivation. 
um, a long history um, and, and associated health consequence industry um, and so on. But we are a small and progressive nation and we have come up with a framework through the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, um, which is helping us to try and think differently and shift to thinking um, to the long term. So our Future Generations Act requires us to demonstrate how all of our institutions, our government and our 43 other institutions, our health boards, our local authorities, our fire and rescue services, our national agencies like Public Health Wales, are planning for the long term, are preventing problems from occurring or from getting worse, are integrating their thinking across all policy areas, are collaborating um, with others and across different sectors and are involving citizens to co-create um, solutions to some of these big uh, problems and challenges that we face. So I think our mission has got to be here to find a way that um, the UK as, um, as a nation um, can actually make that shift from um, acting in the short term from acting in a siloed way to recognising these broader connections across all of our policy areas and recognising that we need to take decisions today in the interests of both current and future generations who are often um, completely absent from the conversation um, in any, any way, shape or form. And I'm so pleased to be able to contribute to our experience is um, in Wales to this discussion um, and the work of the Commission. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Sophie. Um, so we're going to turn now to a uh, question. So do please um, keep submitting your questions. Um, there are a couple here that I want to start with because um, they relate to a conversation that we've certainly grappled with in setting up this Commission. So I have uh, a question from David. He says the one that's reports from 2002 and 2004 made the link between health and wealth and urged the then Labour government imp to implement this fully engaged scenario. Despite signing up to this, 20 years later, little has happened, as NHS Chief Executive Simon Stevens noted in 2014. Instead, health inequalities are widening, a life expectancy has stalled. What is needed is not more analysis, but delivery. So how can the political will to act be found and sustained? And then there's a similar question um, from, from Dan uh, at uh, the Royal College of uh, Physicians. Um, and he's said that the RCP has convened the Inequalities in Health Alliance, bringing together over 200 organisations calling for a cross-government strategy to reduce health inequality. They've written to the Prime Minister a couple of times. He's passed on the letters to the, to the Department for Health and Social Care to respond as a health matter, but we all know the social determinants of health are not in the control of health and care services, hence a cross-government strategy. Apparently the last letter was not even responded to it by our minister, and we've had no response to our request to open a conversation. How does the panel think this bodes for tackling health inequality? So I guess we have two themes there. We have one which is, where does the political will come from? Why have the efforts in the past uh, not succeeded? And then how can the political will for a cross government strategy, not just a health strategy, uh, be won? Um, Sally, do you want to kick us off with that one? Thank you, um, Dan. And um, it, these are both important questions. So my experience is you get political will to change things when there is enough of a surge across the country that it needs changing. And so at the moment, we can see the problems. Everyone probably on this call, and there's 164 of us, is here because we recognize a problem. So how do we move this outwards? Well, you do have to start with some analysis. Oneness is, was fantastic, but we need contemporary analysis and then to get people talking about it. But this commission isn't just about analysis. What we're going to do is do enough analysis to understand underpinning problems and why they're there and to help us think through, so what can be the solutions and raise that awareness to drive political momentum. And you'll notice that we've started with this launch um, paper that brings in the economics. 
the discussion we have to shift is from health being an illness service, I absolutely agree with Sophie as she said it, and a cost to the economy, from getting health right is an investment that gives us a prosperous economy. And I think that narrative is beginning to happen, but we need the analysis, some of the solutions to really drive it forward. And I always talk to people about tobacco. You know, it took 50 years from knowing tobacco was harmful to getting it banned in public places. It does take time. And if we say, well, you know, people have tried and failed before, so let's leave it, then we've got it wrong. We've got to keep coming back to this until we get it right and we get people on board. And I think the moment could be right and we can shape it with a number of papers over the next 18 months that will help get it right. And I think that the minute we take it into the finance ministry, then you begin to get a much better discussion, Dan. And I hope you and your alliance will help us shape this looking for solutions, which is why I'm calling for talking about drivers of inequality and ill health, not determinants. Let's stop being passive. Let's be active about this. There are things that can be changed and they must be for fairness and prosperity. Thank you. That's a really important point on uh, language, Sally. Um, Sophie, you have to deal with these questions of political will all of the time. What, what would you say to those questions? Um, well, there's something that's really helpful in Wales, that we've got a law that requires them to, um, to think and act differently. That doesn't necessarily mean that they always absolutely comply with the law, and the law is one you know small part of a whole kind of um, you know, systems approach to trying to change the ways that we do things. But, you know, it does place duties on our government. Can I come back on one other thing? Um, Sophie, I think we're losing your internet. Um, I think we might have lost Sophie momentarily, so I might come back to her. See. May I come back on one yes. thing? Yes, you go for it, Sally. Um, in my penultimate annual report um, as Chief Medical Officer, Johnny Person Stuttart and I asked that beside GDP, we should have a national statistic called the National Health Index. And actually, the then Cabinet Secretary commissioned that from the Office of National Statistics and they're now on the second version of it. And it has three big domains, healthy people, healthy places, healthy lives. And actually that is one way by drawing attention, Dan, I'm not sure whether you're aware of this, to people, um, of people to the National Health Index, talking about it, you can deconstruct it down to localities and beginning to see how things are. It begins with a national statistic to open this discussion up. So I just wanted to add that in. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. Um, I think Sophie might be back on a different network. <laughs> Apologies. Sorry, everyone. I've uh, quickly switched networks. Hopefully this one will be um, will be better. What I was saying is that, um, um, you know, in answer to the question, how do we, you know, how do we shift political um, mindsets? Well, um, having a law that requires them to do that is quite um, is quite helpful. And just a plug for a private members bill that is going through the UK Parliament at the moment to have a UK Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, which would place the same, uh, in fact, more extensive legal duties on um, the government and other public sector institutions to to do the things that I described the Welsh legislation um, does. I think there's something about, um, you know, calling out the madness in a way, which, um, you know, Sally puts it far more eloquently than me. She's going to, uh, we're going to use the data and, um, you know, really explain the issue there. But to me, it's calling out the madness, the fact that we are in a system um, whereby, you know, our public health director in um, CUMTAF Health Board, which is the health board which covers our South Wales Valleys, our most deprived communities, said that if the World Health Organization had come to us in January 2020 and said there's a pandemic coming, 
predicting which communities in your area will be hardest hit. They could have absolutely predicted um, with probably a, you know, a 99% degree of certainty which communities they would be. Now that says to me, we have been willfully blind. We have that data. Um, we know what the issues are to a large extent. We know what the solutions are, but we have been willfully blind to take in action to actually address um, some of that. I think there's something about the day-to-day -day interactions in the system so you often have a high level, uh, you know, a high level uh, policy perspective, all the right words in the right documents. But when it comes down to the day to day interactions, we're working on annual budgets. Um, we're working on performance measures, which are about measuring how long your ambulance has taken um, to arrive or um, how long your, your A&E wait was and so on. And of course, all of those things are important things to um to the public but nobody is measuring why are you in a and e in the first place um, we have a metrics which is how satisfied were you with the 10 minute appointment you had with your gp or your consultant again important to test that but actually a better metrics would be how satisfied are you with the quality of your life and we therefore need i think there's something that this commission can do to be looking at those wider um, issues what would performance measurement look like um, in a system which was getting to those drivers of health rather than um, the easily measured things which are the sort of accountability framework which are the subject of the day-to-day -day interactions between government and health and are completely sort of ticking the box and missing the point in my um, in my view. Fantastic thank you um, and then finally Chris I don't know if you want to come in and say anything about how the commission how we'll be approaching um, the political will question at IPPR. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, I think I think there's two strands to that answer. One is the kind of vested interest that the Commission can give a broader group of people. So I think, to your point, Sally, just a reiteration that I think the kind of evidence that we can provide to people in the UK finance ministry and those that have to care about the metrics treasury care about because that's how policy decisions get made. I think we can provide a lot of that. Something from the launch report that stands out to me in terms of making it very tangible is the kind of demonstration of what other countries are doing. And we make the comparison to Japan, a country that in the 1960s was amongst the least healthy, if not the least healthy, in the G7, and that today is uh, very well known for having remarkable um, health and being very long-lived. That transition has been remarkable, and, and, and we find that should the UK make a similar transition to get to the health standards seen in Japan today, that um, there could be a 1.2% boost to worker productivity, way, way above uh, the kind of uh, increases the UK has been able to achieve recently. So that kind of enlightened self-interest and the kind of transition of the arguments into a way that others outside the health sector understand, I think is very important. I think the other thing is the, the breadth of the coalition um, that the commission brings together feels very important to me. So I think to a certain extent, there's an element of when the health sector say, as the health sector, health inequalities are very severe, that that in some way has been uh, costed in by policy and by politics. Um, but the group in the Commission are broader than that. So we're delighted to be working with unions, with businesses, with business representative groups, with civil society. And I think then the case um, with those people brought together becomes much harder to ignore because it's in some cases it will be surprising, in other cases um, it doesn't feel so, of course that's what they'd say. So I think, um, you know, kind of beyond the analysis that, that I also think is very important, um, another route to making sure that the kind of final recommendations put forward in 18 months, two years time um, are taken very seriously. Fantastic, thanks, Chris. Um, I have a question from Brenda here and it's um, about spending. So. She says that science funding has been cut, cuts the successor to public, the successor to public health England have been cut, um, cuts the NHS and councils and real terms against not having enough funding for uh, preventative and acute health care. To what extent is this a funding question versus a policy question? Excuse me. Uh, Ara, could I start, start with you? Yeah, I mean, you know, when do you stop the spending? I think we've done reasonably well uh, in recent times with the funding settlements for the health service uh, in terms of GDP spent. 
on the other hand, I don't think with the current economic climate, we're gonna actually spend more on health uh, as much as we want to. Uh, so, and these are the choices, some difficult choices that society has to make. If we continue the sickness service as we have at the moment, historically, we all know that is about a 2% growth above GDP on an annual basis. That is not sustainable. It won't be that far from now. We'll become a complete basket case as they are in the United States, spending 18, 19% of their GDP. You know, you just need to go back in history and look at the impact of the United States expenditure on health to those figures completely outlier in terms of their car industry, in terms of, you know, because in most of these employer health is part of the insurance of the company that employs them. So unless we change the mindset and say, okay, there might be a transition period of time, but we really need to concentrate on this. How do we keep people healthier? Uh, and, you know, Dame Sally has been a champion of public health. You just need to read her reports. Uh, and many, you know, historically, are CMOs and their contribution in public health. But I think we need to go beyond that. Science, the way we know it today, is very different than the science of a population-based approach. We can actually start thinking in terms of pre-disease. And let me just say what that means. And, Science could today tell us, you know, there's a significant chunk of the population who are disease positive, but symptom negative. In other words, they have no interaction. They are in pre-disease states. How could we identify them? How could we preempt health? How could we intervene earlier and at least slow the progression of disease or at least reverse that disease? And we, we've done that in certain genetic disorders where we have genetic biomarkers that we can actually go and deal with a BRCA2 gene in breast cancer. But there are in chronic disease management, you know, most of those who present with diabetes to primary care, they probably were in a pre-diabetic state for at least five years before they turn up to a clinic. So we need to put our innovations and our new investments. I mean, vaccine, the reason the return on investment on vaccine is so great because you're protecting people uh, against the infection. Uh, but that's a population-based approach. We know now with data analytics, thanks to all the work that Sally did and many of the other organizations around the country and really getting the, at least imagining the value of data, we can stratify the population into different risk categories, not just on their genetic data, on their phenotypic data, on their behaviorals, and then intervene at an early stage, find the right incentives to engage an individual citizen in their own health, uh, as we did during COVID. You know, every member of the public has become a public health doc. You know, social distancing, wearing masks, they were engaged in that threat and they protected themselves. There is a possibility here in the future, we can engage the citizens at a, at, based on their risk profile and they could have that in confidence in proactively engaging in their health. There's obviously the outliers, which have to have a different solution to that. But I think we can shift, if we shift the needle a little bit to the left from that pathway that starts from healthy and well-being through pre-sickness into sickness, I think we can really save significant amount of and divert the resources into preventive health. And history will tell you the biggest scientific impactful interventions of health have been in prevention and public health. I think we can also do it in delaying the progress of aging, disease, uh, if we can identify those earlier. Thanks very much. And please excuse me having a minor coughing fit there. I, I think it's gone. <laughs> um, I'm going to turn now to a question from Dee, and it does relate to, to the data point, actually. Um, so she says, I'm interested in the panel's views on what needs to happen to go further for those at the sharp end of health inequalities, the inclusion health groups, including those experiencing homelessness, sex workers, and the gypsy and traveller communities. Data and identification seem like a good starting point, but the barriers to change are significant. Um, Marie, I wonder if you want to start with that one. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Yeah. Um, so I think as a commission, one of the 
the positive uh, things is about the wider coalition that we are forming. Um, and I'm sort of building more on um, what people have said previously about how it's important that we are a, a kind of like a movement um, of, of like-minded people, um, but with, with practical recommendations based on robust evidence um, and re recommendations that the government uh, can adopt and actually others um, can adopt um, as, as we move forward. I think within that coalition, has to be those people who are at the, who, are, who are actually on the front line and experiencing that. We know that there are specific groups in our community who have a, a huge contribution to make, both to our, to our economy but also to our wider society. But face discrimination, discrimination, um, and and restriction to opportunities. We did some work at the Race and Health Observatory looking at the experience of migrants um, and access to services to the pandemic um, and of course found that that um, it was very difficult for, for this community to access care but obviously they were also um, impacting on other members of the community because they, they, they were out and about and, and during a, a pandemic about being able to get vaccinated. So I, so I do believe that part of our work has to be focused on those groups that are most vulnerable, those groups that are most discriminated against, because our experience shows us if it works for those groups, it will work for the majority of the population. Thank you. Thanks, Bree. Chris, I don't know if you want to confirm how we treat that in the Commission. Yeah, I'm very happy to see. I think I think it's incredibly important, and we're thinking about it very carefully. I mean, I I, I think the best thing is to endorse um, what you said, Marie. That the the evidence strikes us as very strong throughout um, health, public health care. That um, that thinking about where health is the worst and what gains uh, in good health can be achieved, and what in, what steps need to be taken to to achieve that is the best foundation as a plan for everyone. So that kind of logic will be at the heart of our thinking as we keep going through the next 18 months. Great, thank you very much. Um, and I was just trying to find, I've got a lot of questions now. Um, so David has says, I completely support Sally's response. I'm not entirely sure which question you're actually responding to there, David, so apologies. Um, he says, but I wonder if we're at a defining moment in our politics. We seem to have a broken political system, at least as far as England is concerned. Wales, as Sophie mentioned, and Scotland are arguably more disposed to acknowledge and address the health and wealth issue. Health has to be on the agenda of finance departments, as Sally argues, but the Treasury mindset, tracked as it is in a neoliberal frame of thinking, is totally opposed to what the Commission is seeking to do. Serious investment is needed to level up and improve health. How can we reform our political system and the treasury which dominates government and what is it able to do or not do? Uh, Sophie, I wonder if that's one for you. Well, um, how do you reform a political um, system? I guess that's, you know, partially down to the um, down to the electorate. Um, but I think, you know, there are things around, you know, pressing the buttons um, that matter to people. And, you know, if the Treasury is concerned with economic growth, there's very clear, um, you know, as has been set out already, very clear correlations to, um, you know, to, to health and economic growth. And I think there's also a case to be made around um, the efficient use of public money. Um, someone asked the question earlier, you know, does this require more money? Well, yes, it probably will require more money, but it also requires us to spend the money that we've got at the moment differently um, and in a more collaborative um, way. So as an example of one of the things that has come out with our approach in Wales, in our capital city, to deal with the problem of congestion in our capital city, a public health consultant was seconded to the council to to deal with that, that that problem of congestion and when you apply a public health lens to a problem with congestion um, rather than a highways engineering lens you get a completely different set of solutions and reduction of air pollution at the areas with the lowest levels um, of life expectancy um, you get cleaning and greening of those communities you get a range of different things I'm sorry it's saying my internet connection is unstable again I'm not doing very well today but can you still hear me 
Yeah. And so there's not actually, you know, that money was going to be spent on dealing with congestion. Um, but you bring different people into that conversation and you apply a health lens to how do we deal with congestion rather than a kind of transportation lens. And that's where you start to get these really different and interesting solutions. So I think some of what we're talking about here is just finding ways for the system to broaden its thinking, broaden the ecosystem that makes decisions and to be thinking holistically. And that's where I was saying um, health needs to be everyone's business and um, environment, economy, culture needs to be health's business as well. We are spending billions and billions of pounds um, on procuring goods and services. Are we doing that in a way which is driving benefits um, to our health environment and so on? Probably not. We're spending billions and billions of pounds on infrastructure are we spending uh, that money in a way which is going to improve health um, and improve our environment and so on or are we only thinking it, it about it in a very linear kind of economic sense so I think that there are ways um, to change a political system from the ground up as well as you know how actually people vote and um, and so on. Um, but I think that there needs to be that kind of framework and permission, um, encouragement and support for people um, in the system to be able to do that. Thanks. And related to this, we have a couple of other questions which ask about this kind of structure of government point. Someone uh, asks about local government and the role of local government in, in achieving a lot of this. Um, another person has asked about um, how we can make sure all of the departments recognise the benefits that are occurring to them from investment in health. Uh, Sally, I don't know, do you, do you want to speak to this? Well, um, let me pick up on, I think, to get this right, we need action at every level. Um, and so clearly local government has a big role to play and needs empowering and needs the appropriate money. But the one I do want to pick up on is the commercial drivers. We know that the private sector spend a terrific amount of money. Are they supporting their workforces and their workforces' families effectively? Are they thinking about how to make getting to work a healthy thing? Being at work is healthy. There were experiments, for instance, the Karelia experiment in um, Finland, showing that when that whole area chose to work together, and the East Anglia has similar examples, they could really improve health, cardiovascular health, weight and things. So I think we should not shy away from every level, but really try and get the private sector as employers and as taxpayers and as part of our community engaged in this as well. Could I just build on on Sally's point, which is absolutely just to remind the audience that actual fact, the mayors have a quite a significant role to play here. Uh, and uh, and I know this by experience working in London, I think the mayors uh, by law are accountable on the health of the, uh, of, of the cities that their mayoral duties lie. It, it not, it's the preventative side. Uh, and I think every, uh, and I think the dissemination of the mayoral model is a very promising way forward in getting local government with the mayoral leadership to have a impact on uh, on, on health in big cities, at least. Thanks. And I've just seen a, a question from Claire asking about whether we'll be looking at the role of employers, which I think you've just spoken to, Sally. Um, Chris, do you want to say anything else about how the Commission will, will think about these questions? Yes, absolutely. So I think I think there's there's a lot within the Commission that can take on the point that you make, Sally, around every level. So I think for us, there's something obviously in terms of the kind of infrastructure and fit of government. So there's a question, uh, obviously, of how uh, kind of health and, and prosperity are brought together in health and care, but much more broadly than that. And I think some of the infrastructure that's already been talked about in terms of how do we get other government departments outside of health and care to care about health are vital whether that needs a measure that holds uh, accountability for health alongside GDP, whether that's around 
what the instruments are from impact assessments and onwards, what the ideas are that can make that matter in terms of how decision making actually goes about. Um, I think that's a hugely interesting question. But given the point also came through on local authorities, it's important to say that I don't think the Commission focuses only on Westminster or on national policy making. We're incredibly keen that this is about far more than that. So one major element of the Commission's work will be working with um, people in places across the country to work out what they think health is, how they define it, how they understand it, what they think the kind of onus is on all the different kinds of actors that we're talking about, whether that's local government, whether that's employers, services, the NHS, the whole kind of health economy. I suspect, you know, hy hypothetically going into that, what we'll see is the kind of binary that we often talk about in the political discourse of kind of it's all about individual choice and personal responsibility, or it's all about national government will actually be askew to say that we'll see that people have um, in discourse, uh, in conversation, a much more nuanced understanding and an idea of what they want the role to be of that whole kind of coalition of different people that, that have a big kind of impact on their health. But that's just one example, I think, of how we'll look as a commission to understand um, kind of that broad role of, of all the people. And we know that it's so many people that do impact the health of the nation and therefore the, the prosperity of the nation as well. Um, yeah, I'll leave it there. Great. <clears throat> thank you, Chris. And I think we now have to say goodbye to Sophie, who I think has, has to leave for something else. So thank you very much, Sophie, for your time today. Um, I have got a question here from Kieran, uh, and it's quite an urgent question. So he says, excellent discussions, thank you. Bringing it right to the moment, it's clear that the cost of living crisis is a health crisis too. Health issues and problems with money exacerbate each other. Financial insecurity and deteriorating health can create a vicious cycle that gets progressively worse if left unchecked. How do we respond with sufficient urgency to this cost of living challenge? Um, which of the panelists would like to take that one? Arrow, is that you um, taking uh, yourself off mute? I, I mean, it's not my area of of, uh, of expertise, but I, I, I well, firstly, I couldn't agree more with the sentiment of the question. Absolutely clear. Whether I have the solution is the bit that I would not have. I mean, the whole world is going through an unbelievable inflationary pressure at the moment, and and I think COVID was one thing. No one expected Ukraine and the tragic set of uh, the war in Europe. So, uh, to be honest, I, there's, if, if there is one thing on the minds of the politi political elite at the moment is the inflationary pressures. You can see that being part of the narrative of everybody said, whether it's the chancellor or the leader of the opposition in all parliamentary debates uh, in the last week or 10 days. There is no easy solution for that. There are choices to be made and the, some of these choices are very difficult. The depth levels that we have are horrendous. Uh, if we just cross the, uh, you know, it took nearly 100 years to build a 22 trillion debt in the United States, but they doubled that from 22 trillion to 33 trillion in three years. Uh, you know, uh, and so these are all very, very challenging uh, financial uh, sustainability questions that is beyond, beyond my pay grade, but uh, I think getting the balance right is the most critical thing, is, is I think the way out of this has to be balanced. Uh, it can't be a short-term fix. It's most likely to be a long-term fix, uh, uh, well, it'd be a long-term solution rather than a fix, and uh, uh, that's all really what I could say about it. This is not my subject uh, area, but I, I do worry about it, not just in my household, but I worry about it in terms of you know, could we afford the health service? Could we afford many, many other things that are coming out of taxation at the moment? Marie, is this something that you, you see in your work, the impact of the cost of living crisis and what sorts of solutions might fix it? I mean, one, one that comes to mind and it relates to a question from Sarah actually is housing and the extent to which we, we need heating and so on to, uh, to, to be safe and healthy. Um, is that something you come across? Um, actually, we were only um, a, a couple of days ago having a conversation with GPs um, who are talking about patients who are coming in 
um, and low wage earners who are having to make decisions between purchasing medication and actually being um, and, and food on the table. So in a very real way, it's impacting on health already. Um, and I know there's been other research about how our costs, um, you know, economic challenges increase um, to health. So it's definitely something that we're seeing already. And we know about the increased use in food banks. Um, rather like ARA, I do not have the answers to that, but the answer can't be um, to ignore the health challenges that we have because we need a longer term solution to get us to a point again of a stable economy. And that does require the NHS, for example, to think about how it does invest its 25 billion plus uh, of money that it spends on goods, how it supports and enables um, its employees being you know, the largest employer in, in the UK. So I think this is a challenge for all of us, not just for government, but within all sectors about how we work together um, in a sort of systemic way to support our communities uh, through this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask uh, a couple more questions from, from the Q&A and then, and then we, I might turn to our panellists for final remarks. Um, one I did want to raise, um, it's been raised a couple of times by, by different members of the audience. There's a question from Chris. Um, so the pandemic has wreaked havoc on the social care sector as well as the NHS. So Carers UK estimate that 600 people quit their jobs every day due to the significant demands of providing unpaid informal care to loved ones. What work will the Commission do to assess the relationship between prosperity and a functioning social care system? Um, and then similarly, Helen uh, has put in the chat, thanks for ensuring representation of disabled people's organisations uh, on the Commission. Um, she'd like to ask that the Commission does not lose sight of the social care crisis and the intensifying intersecting negative impacts upon disabled people's health and wellbeing outcomes from social care rationing, staff shortages and charging. I think it's a really important point. Would any of our uh, panellists like to talk about how they see the social care sector and, and the challenges it faces in relation to these questions? I mean, I'll come in because we did with the IPPR uh, in 20, I think it would have been, was it 17? We did a, a piece of work on better health, better care. And obviously social care funding was the major issue of that, which has cost the careers of many prime ministers in this country, as you probably remember. Uh, it didn't really take on and it didn't receive the attention that we thought is worthy of it being received because we were thinking of a, a tax funded system and uh, we would have uh, uh, by actual fact uh, increase, increasing the uh, the the uh, the taxation uh, at a lower level uh, and i think by 2030 would have paid for social care it would have been the most cost effective model of delivering social care uh, and and to my surprise as you remember last summer was it summer before the prime minister announced the uh, the increase in contributions, and that's been a quite a uh, interesting debate in Parliament over the last eight months. But I think it's gone through, which I think is the right model. Uh, in terms of emphasising, I mean, you know, we tend to forget. We talk about our physical health and well-being. We don't talk about our social health. Social health is as important. And some of the recent studies that you see, for example, loneliness. You know, loneliness in terms of harm is equivalent to smoking. 14, 15 cigarettes a day, you know, uh, all other aspects of social health is absolutely critical in the, in the health and well-being of our senior citizens. And it's not just senior citizens, by the way, social health is needed across all age groups. Uh, so I was delighted to see that uh, at least we have a funding mechanism. Uh, I wasn't very happy to see that the diversion to getting rid of the elective uh, waiting list as being the first two years and then sub subsequently moving. And I hope there will be some dividing line between what we spend in our health systems and what we spend in social health, uh, social care. So I, I hope we, once we get through the big, huge burden of the, uh, of those 5 million waiting for their urgent operations that we will get to some form of a balance in spending between the two. 
<clears throat> Thank you. Would any others like to come in on that? If not, I will move on to uh, Chris. Sorry. Yeah, only, only only really to say that I think there are at the very least, you know, in terms of what I'm thinking about coming into this, three very big questions in in social care to answer. One is one is the question um, of kind of continued question of of cost. So um, whether whether we've got to a place with with government reforms that that quite answer that in a progressive way, particularly thinking about people without huge assets and, and savings, then uh, that remains a question. There's something about the question of workforce, as, as has been mentioned in one of the questions, so pay um, as a kind of big one, em employment kind of conditions, retention, and the kind of big turnover, big vacancies rates that exist there. And another, you know, a, a, an essential question I think for us to consider in the Commission of um, kind of the link between those kinds of policy agendas and um, uh, the the experiences of people who draw on social care, which are often um, so poor and mechanical. Um, and I think there's kind of huge opportunity in the framing of of health and, and prosperity to think about that very carefully. I mean, one that always kind of jumps to mind just most immediately is is that kind of workforce question how other countries are uh, are approaching social care workforce question it's a very future proof job it's something that uh, could be at the very core of our economy if we can get things like um paying conditions right because it's very resistant to automation it's very um good in terms of being a green sector or a relatively green sector so those are the kind of uh, I suppose if we're thinking about hypotheses coming in that I think the Commission uh, sets itself up well to answer, um, but also a, a message that it will be a, a key part of the thinking that we're doing. Great. And I have one more question I did want to get to. Um, Sally, I might uh, ask you this one. Um, and it's from Joe, and he says, can you address a warning from the Frameworks Institute for the Health Foundation that making a prosperity argument for health to the public can book fire? because it can be seen as commodifying human beings and priming people to think in individualistic ways. Um, I, how do you think we should be thinking and talking about the concept of prosperity? Is it useful for making this argument? Well, I've always found it useful, but I find the Frameworks Institute work very good. So thank you, Joe. I picked that one up and um, had a mental tag that I'd better go and find the report. Um, We've got to find a way of talking about prosperity. It, and it may well be that, as they say, that isn't the best way. They've come up with something better. Um, because this isn't just about individuals. We all do take choices. Um, but as I used to say to ministers, what we have to do is make the healthy choice the easy choice throughout life. Not just the right choice, but you default to health every time. And that takes um, everyone participating, uh, us as individuals and families, but locally, regionally, nationally, and very much our um, private sector. And so what I'm looking for is a way to get that to happen, to unlock that particular key. How do we make the healthy choice the easy choice for everyone? Thank you. Thanks. And if I might add, as an economist on, on the Commission, I think we very much will be thinking about a broad set of economic measures um, and what economic success means. There isn't a thing called the economy that exists outside of people. It's um, our collective, collective future that we're interested in. Um, and we have uh, read that report with a lot of interest. It's really great work from Frameworks and we'll be um, continuing to, to work with uh, framing experts to make sure that we're making the best possible argument that we can. Um, I'm going to bring the questions to a close now and ask each of our uh, panelists just to say a few final words, reflecting on anything that you've heard in the discussion and perhaps something that you're really looking forward to uh, to working on through, through the Commission's life. Um, I think one thing that's really apparent from this conversation is that it's such a broad topic. There are so many things that we could be looking into. Um, and so I'd like to hear from you really what you're what you're looking forward to and what you'd like to see it achieve. Um, Chris, would you like to start? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the thing that excites me about the Commission on Health and Prosperity is its potential to bring 
people together. Uh, Sophie's Sophie's gone, so I'll 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 take her point of connection. And I think that's the kind of uh, you know you can think about that as um, people who vote for different parties. We know that health and economy speaks out across. Uh, voters for all major UK parties, it's uh, unions and businesses, all of whom are represented within the commission. It's people across sectors who will point out or have uh, a vested interest in the health of the country as, as that kind of keystone of, of a fair society and a strong economy that we've talked about. So that's the thing that really excites me. It's the the, the kind of uh, connection that the vision that we might come up with uh, could offer. Um, yeah, that's for me. Great. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Marie? Um, actually, today has been one of the reasons why I know I'm going to really enjoy the, the commission, because I've obviously clearly heard and seen from the chat conversation that it's something that's really needed and urgently so, and that there are lots of people working this together, so there's going to be a, a coalition of the willing, um, which, which is great. Um, so that's one of the things that's going to be really, really great. The other bit that I think I'm particularly interested in, um, is, which has been highlighted today, is the work um, with communities and particularly those that are most affected, um, you know, most excluded um, from both health and from prosperity and thinking about how they can actually shape our insights and our rec resulting recommendations. And finally, the thing I'm looking forward to most is the change that will result. Um, so I'm looking forward to the whole journey. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, Ara. Well, I'll come back to health and well-being and just to remind everyone, the last century life expectancy was doubled because of science. Uh, I would even go back and say in 1871, when Queen Victoria introduced the first public health bill through parliament, that was the most novel thing this country did in terms of public health. And I would always describe Queen Victoria as the best public health doc this globe has seen. And, uh, and we need to go back to that basics, health and maintaining health and well-being is the most critical thing a society could do rather than focusing and concentrating on sickness services. And I think most of what we deal with today is preventable, but the only way to change that and change that mindset is to change the mindset of the citizen uh, the individual citizen, governments, science, and shifting that needle more towards maintaining good health rather than treating disease. Brilliant. Thank you. And Sally? So I embrace what others have said, obviously. I think we've had a really exciting discussion today because we've heard inputs from people that have made me think Ah, oh, can we go there? Can we do this, that or the other? Clearly we can't do everything, but I think it is exciting. I hope that uh, along our way, we'll have some town hall meetings so we do get lots of input. This is about how we move together to, um, as Marie said, build that coalition of the willing to have an impact and make a difference so people's health improves. An exciting opportunity and I think we can make a difference. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Well, we're certainly uh, very excited to be getting stuck into the work, um, having, having built the commission and launched it. So all it falls to me now is to say a huge thank you to uh, all of our uh, panelists, to Chris, head of, the, head of the commission, and your contact, should you want to speak to IPPR about it, um, to Marie, to Ara, to Sally, um, and also to Sophie, of course, who are all commissioners and Ara and Sally will be chairing the commission. Uh, a huge thanks again to our supporters and partners uh, who we're working with uh, to do this. And finally, to all of you for coming along today uh, and for such a brilliant discussion. Uh, sorry that we couldn't get to all of the questions, but I think hopefully we managed to cover a really good range um, and we will certainly save the other ones uh, so that we can consider them later. But thank you very much and have a brilliant afternoon.